Ethical Perspectives on the News is produced by the Interreligious Council of Lynn County, which is solely responsible for its content. The views and opinions expressed on this program do not necessarily reflect those of the staff and management of KCRG TV9. Good day and welcome to Ethical Perspectives on the News. My name is Leon Tabak. I will moderate today's discussion. Our topic is Russia 30 years later. We are approaching the 30th anniversary of the end of the Soviet Union. This took place on Christmas Day, 1991. We have with us three people who know Russia well, uh, professors in the, in the local area. Jonathan Dries and Lynn Ekoch work with me at Cornell College, and Bill Reisinger is teaching at the University of Iowa. Jonathan is a professor of history, who's lived and studied, and not only in Russia, but in uh, republics that were formerly a part of the Soviet Union. And Lynn teaches a Russian language for us, and uh, Russian history, uh, Russian literature, and uh, and film as well. Uh, Bill is in the, in the in the Department of Polit Political Science, I think, and uh, has written several books about uh, politics in Russia and uh, and the Soviet Union. So I'd like you to say a little bit more about yourselves and uh, your involvement in our subject. Uh, maybe we can begin with you, Jonathan. You have a very interesting background there. Uh, go ahead. Sure. Um, hello, uh, I'm Jonathan Dries. I'm an assistant professor of European and Russian history at Cornell College in Iowa. Um, my main area of expertise is Soviet history, uh, specifically uh, Soviet Central Asia. Uh, my research looks at uh, Communist Party propaganda in Kazakhstan during the Stalinist era of the Soviet Union. And at Cornell, I also uh, teach uh, Russian Soviet history, European history, uh, international as well as military history. And Lynn, uh, tell us a little bit about your uh, your experiences in Russia, your teaching at Cornell College, whatever you think might uh, might help make the connection here. Sure, yeah. I teach, uh, as, as Leon said, I teach language, literature, and culture. I'm really invested. I love, I fell in love with the culture through literature and um, I, I really enjoy teaching it. And I, and I love trying to get students to view Russia and use that as a reflection on their own culture. And um, I've spent some time in Russia and I'm particularly interested in cultural aspects and the way literature, film and the arts have uh, developed and actually uh, have changed over the years. Um, and so those are my sort of main things. Also identity, Russian identity, how Russians see themselves and see their place in the world. So those are my particular interests. And Bill, how did you come to uh, make, make the study of Russia a, a, a specialty here? Uh, yeah, uh, thanks, Leanna. And uh, it's a real pleasure to join everyone here uh, this evening. So I got started in, uh, as an undergraduate studying the Russian language and Russian politics, and then went to graduate school to continue those studies. Uh, the real opportunity for me came in the 1983-84 academic year when I got the opportunity to uh, travel to Moscow and spend the time there uh, studying at Moscow State University and doing dissertation research. Uh, and since then, I've been teaching at the University of Iowa, teaching courses on Russian politics and Russian foreign policy, among others. Uh, my research has uh, focused on a number of different topics in those areas, um, but uh, one of the primary themes has been Russian public opinion, Russian uh, individual Russians take on politics and their outlooks and views. Very good. Okay. Now, I thought that uh, you could help us frame the conversation by uh, maybe uh, Jonathan can tell us a little bit about the, the difference between the Soviet Union and Russia and the sort of the geography that uh, helps, helps us understand this. And Bill, you could tell us a little bit about the political developments here. So Bill, why don't you start with what happened in 1991 and maybe in the few years before that, the few years after that, tell us what, what kinds of changes took place. Well, really dramatic ones. And, and uh, the, the transition that the Soviet Union and, and its successor states faced um, was, uh, if not unprecedented in uh, contemporary or in, 
in relatively modern world history, certainly unusual. That is, um, they, there was a drastic remaking of the state and the state institutions, of uh, the culture, of uh, social relations, uh, of the economy. They had to go from a uh, planned economy to a capitalist one, uh, and of, of the political system. And so all these things happened at once. Uh, and uh, this was a, a breakdown of the Soviet system, partly because it uh, had run out of steam on its own rights, partly because uh, there was a mad dash to try to um, uh, sort of reconfigure things uh, under Gorbachev at the very end of the Soviet system, and uh, partly because uh, people then after the Soviet Union had broken up, we're trying to figure out what are we going to do now? And uh, so uh, it was really a, a collapsing of a political slash economic slash social system. Uh, and then the, all the successor countries needed to rebuild those things again from 1991 on. Okay. Jonathan, give us a, a picture of what the Soviet Union was, maybe uh, starting with some geography there. Sure. So um, the Soviet Union, it uh, was the largest country in the world for the entirety of its existence. It stretched, I think at the time, uh, 11 time zones from its uh, westernmost borders to its easternmost borders. And um, it was made up of 15 specific uh, Union republics, kind of smaller countries or regions within the larger Soviet Union. And the one, the republic that we're most familiar with today is the Russian Soviet uh, Federative Social Republic. It was the largest republic within the Soviet Union. Um, and it, it was, uh, these republics were based off of ethnic groups, the size of specific nationalities and minorities. Uh, the Russians, they had the largest republic, partly because they were the largest ethnic group. But there were um, eventually 14 other Union Republics within the Soviet Union corresponding with the next uh, 14 largest ethnic groups, roughly. You had uh, Kazakhstan for the Kazakhs, Armenia for the Armenians, and Ukraine for the Ukrainians. And these republics with, existed within the larger Soviet Union. So you had Russia, which was very much part of the Soviet Union, but um, not all people living in the Soviet Union were Russians, but they were all Soviets, and they were technically united um, through different state and communist party uh, levels and, and structures. And um, it this was pretty different from the way, say, the United States was kind of uh, structured. We don't have, our, our, our states here are not delineated by ethnicity, but the Soviets chose to delineate their, uh, most of their country based off of uh, uh, ethnicity and ideas of nationalism, uh, in part to kind of uh, get a hold of nationalism and kind of make it work for the Soviet state and the Communist Party. And these national republics, they became so enshrined within the Soviet system that when the Soviet Union finally collapsed in the early 1990s, um, it collapsed along the lines of these different Union republics, which is why the 15 Union republics um, they eventually became the 15 independent republics of what's usually called the, the former Soviet Union, although it was a could be a pretty messy process. You have breakaway states in like uh, Moldova with Transnistria and also places like uh, Abkhazia and South Ossetia, which were part of Georgia um, during the Soviet Union, but upon independence attempted to break away from the Georgian Republic. So you also, if I could add something, ahead, Leon, Leon yeah. um, even and and I, of course, everything Jonathan said is correct. But but what's interesting to me, particularly in terms of identity, is the Russian, what is now Russia and the Ru even the Russian Socialist Federalist Republic was not all Russian. Right. Mm -hmm. I mean, you had quite a few other ethnic minorities within that, within right. these sort of autonomous republics. And we still have that today. Right. I mean, they're you know majority ethnic Russians but you do have other nationalities living within Russia and it was that way then. So, you know, who was given their own actual Republic and who was uh, sort of put into an autonomous Republic still within Russia is an interesting question. And I certainly don't know all the details, but it's still a multi-ethnic state, even when it broke up. I mean, Russia as it stands today is still multi-ethnic. Yeah, no, Lynn has talked to me about teaching uh, literature and stories of conflicts between Russians and Chechens uh, going back long before uh, these events here, right? How many of these republics were ever independent nations before 1991? Um, you know? 
Um, I think several of them were. You had um, in Central Asia, you had kind of these tributary states around Bukhara and Kiva, which existed as kind of like uh, vassal states to the Tsar um, in the late 19th century. And uh, you had the Baltic states, which were able to declare independence from uh, the, um, the, uh, the Russian Empire during the Re revolution and the end of World War I, which were independent for a number of years, for, for most of the interwar period between World War I and World War II. Uh, the Soviet Union eventually invaded them and kind of brought them into the Soviet Union um, during the, kind of during the early days of World War II with uh, the Molotov-Ribbentrop Pact in 1940. And then um, at certain points of time in the revolution itself, you had um, some kind of breakaway republics in, in the Caucasus with Georgia and Azerbaijan attempting at different points in time to exist as independent countries, but which were eventually invaded and um, annexed into the Soviet Union in the early 20s. So, Bill, has, has some of the idealism of the communist era survived? Uh, are, 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 to what extent are, are the Russian people holding on to part of the Soviet legacy, uh, taking pride in part of that history? What can you say there? Uh, well, okay, so there's two things. Um, there's very little idealism left. That, that idea of the, um, the bright Soviet future when communism as a uh, sort of utopian system of um, access to uh, adequate goods for everyone uh, and other, you know, other sorts of uh, things that would be, would be, uh, you know, would make life great for everyone. Um, that ideal was really no longer uh, accepted by uh, Soviet citizens probably from the 1960s on. Um, mm. Nikita Khrushchev issued an edict that uh, they would achieve communism within two decades from the early 60s to the early 80s or something. And, and mostly that received uh, chuckles uh, from other Soviets uh, and things. So I think some of the idealism that you might have seen in the 1920s is really gone by the late Soviet period. And certainly Russia today has no ideology in the sense that Marxism-Leninism was an ideology during Soviet times. So people don't have that same kind of idea. Uh, they do, however, have a lot of pride in the accomplishments that they see in the Soviet uh, period. Um, so what, one of the things that one of the leading survey groups in Russia is the Levada Center, and, and they every year to ask Russians what they're most proud of in their history. Uh, and going back to the pre-Putin period in the 90s, uh, consistently the number one thing is the victory in World War II. Mm -hmm. So uh, what they call the Great Patriotic War uh, is listed as something that makes Russians proud by up to 90 percent of mm -hmm. Russians. Uh, and the next highest thing uh, is at 43 percent is very far behind is the country's role in space exploration. Uh, so that Soviet era accomplishment of defeating uh, the Nazis and pushing them back and, and helping save the, the world from the Nazi scourge during World War II is still something that Russians uh, see as, as very, very uh, important. Okay, Lynn, I, I know you uh, looked at some survey data as well. I think this might be a good place for you to introduce some of what you've learned here. Well, like like Bill, I mean, I look at the Levada Center. I mean, I'm thanks so thankful that the Levada Center still exists as a as a polling organization. It's an independent polling organization, and just fascinating stuff that comes out. And as Bill pointed out, the things on identity uh, and and pride are are very interesting, and also the I I um, surveys talking about Stalin's perception, and I think. I think this kind of goes along with the pride in World War II. There's been an effort to kind of see the accomplishments rather than all the bad things and focus on the good things that happened during the Soviet period rather than the bad. And Stalin's perception is, you know, has has positive views have increased over time. And so if you look at over the last 20 years, for example, um, respect went from 27% in 2001 to 41% uh, in this year, uh, or, or actually soon, March of 19, March of 2019. And so that idea of seeing Stalin as a person worthy of respect, not necessarily love, or not necessarily admiration is about the same at 4%, but the they respect and the respect of, you know, the accomplishments has gone up. And the, uh, the idea of seeing Stalin as someone to fear has gone down. So those I find those very interesting. And it's the idea of really trying to think about the good things that happened rather than focus on all the bad. And, and Bill, I'm sure you know more about those uh, those issues as well. 
Yeah, I, I uh, you know, th so one of the things that from my perspective uh, is important to note is that these are driven by um, the political interests of people who want to push these kind of interpretations of the past so that, you know, the past isn't s static. It, it, it really depends on how it's framed and mm -hmm. things. And uh, in the Soviet period, a great care was taken to keep the memory of World War II alive. And it, that was reinforced by the fact that so many Soviets had uh, relatives and loved ones who had died in the war. As we get farther away from that, though, um, what you see is that the uh, 1990s, when Yeltsin was president, there was really more of an interest in examining history, warts and all, and trying to understand the past better to move forward. Once Putin comes in, he sort of sets a, an agenda for the country that is, uh, we're not going to talk badly about the past. We want to uh, glorify our past so that we uh, redouble the patriotism among the people, so that we feel proud, so that we can be a strong country again. So I think that you know, when you see changes in public opinion like that, it's in part because the uh, governments and uh, the society at large is really working to reinforce those views. And the film, I mean, the film industry too, and I, I found it really interesting, a couple of films recently where there was sort of a negative uh, view of the past, they were harshly criticized. They weren't banned, but they were criticized. For example, there was a film, uh, many people know about Leviathan in 2014. This isn't about history, but it was a picture, a horribly devastating picture of small town corruption, of the little guy, you know, getting completely crushed by a combination of the, you know, the, the leadership of the town and the church, you know, hand in hand crushing this, this poor guy and taking away his property. Um, so that was harshly criticized, but not banned. Um, Matilda in 2017 was a film about uh, Nicholas II, the last czar, and his affair, premarital affairs before he was married, before he was czar, with a ballerina. But it was the, the, the church was incensed because, of course, the czar has been canonized as a saint. So to see the czar in any way, you know, seen as somehow less than holy was considered, you know, bad by some. Um, and then uh, more recently in 2019, a film called Bratstva, and in, it's called Leaving Afghanistan. It, the English translation is Leaving Afghanistan. And it's not a particularly flattering picture of uh, the end of the Afghanistan war um, for the Soviet, Soviets pulling out. And a lot of people were incensed by it um, because they, they wanted a positive view. They don't want to see the negative view. So you see this playing out in the arts as well as then you see that public opinion, those public opinion polls too, because it's carefully crafted, as Bill said. There is definitely that emphasis on let's remember the good and not uh, focus so much on the bad. And you see that playing out in the media too, or the film industry as well. Yeah. And, and I imagine the lack of access to historical archives is um, is starting to become um, something clearer uh, to you, Jonathan. What, what was that point? I didn't I didn't understand that. Uh, there, there, it's much harder to access uh, archives about Soviet era events than uh, was the case in the 1990s and things. In, in, in some parts of the, of the former Soviet Union, it is like there are more roadblocks to access like the um, some it's still possible to access like the party archives in Moscow and the state archives at Garf, uh, the state archive of the Russian Federation in Moscow. It's, it's those are still relatively open. But um, from what I've been able to see in my own experience, and the experience of others like uh, files and documents that were once open to most people um, in Russia, they're slowly becoming kind of classified where well, one year, uh, one scholar is able to access certain documents. When they come back the next year, they're um, they're kind of uh, they're inaccessible or off limits. Although in, in my experience, I have found that um, other uh, uh, former Soviet republics, especially Kazakhstan, the archives there are very open. Uh, I did most of my research in the uh, state archive and the, uh, the state archive of the, of, of the Republic of Kazakhstan and the presidential archive in Kazakhstan. And there, um, not only was the archive staff much nicer than the archive staff in Russia, and the, the Russian archives uh, are, are known for having very kind of surly, stern um, archival staff. And there was one kind of petty tyrant at the, at the former party archive of Moscow who kind of ruled the reading room with an iron fist for decades. Um, but in Kazakhstan, the, the staff was lovely. The archives are 
almost entirely open. I was able to photograph quite a bit without much limit in the in the Kazakh party archives. Although um, I, I had originally wanted to do a lot of research in Uzbekistan as well. And while the party archives in Kazakhstan were very open, the party archives in Tashkent and Uzbekistan, those, uh, when I was in graduate school, those were very closed off. It was very difficult, if not impossible, for foreigners to access them. They had been uh, opened in the late 90s and early 2000s, but by my time, you had to like know someone who knew someone super important to get into those those files. And there are also other kind of archives that are still very closed. You have the, I think the presidential archive in Moscow is um, closed off to all foreigners. And then archives with like the, um, the former MVD or the former KGB or the internal security forces, even in places like Kazakhstan, those are pretty closed, but those are also very open in places like the Baltic states and Ukraine, where they want people to know about the various crimes and dealings of the secret police during the Soviet period. So it varies kind of by republic and republic and the agenda and view of the Soviet past that these uh, that these countries have. So, I think could I could I just add something about the adding to the public opinion uh, as Bill and uh, Bill was saying the the carefully crafted kind of view uh, the Kremlin point of view of the past, but it's also helped by the fact that Russian media or, or independent media has been the the number of independent media outlets have been declining severely. I mean, in the 1990s there was there were a lot of you know independent media ex in existence, and since you know soon as Putin has taken uh, taken uh, taken control, uh, fewer and fewer of those. So uh, uh, fewer media outlets, fewer independent media. So most of the media that's out there, the the, the mass media, is definitely controlled by the Kremlin. Pro, you know, pro Kremlin, pro Kremlin views. Uh, so there are fewer ways for the general public to see these opposing views. People in general, the polls, and Bill, you probably have seen this too. The poll, the people who are most opposed, for example, to Alexei Navalny, and most in favor of Putin are the people who watch TV the most because the main TV channels are definitely sort of Kremlin controlled. So there has been a you know decline in, in the number of media outlets, which is I, I find very disturbing because you have uh, fewer different kinds of points of view, a, a, a you know, decline in the diversity of points of view. Well, so Russians now are, have greater freedom to travel and presumably have greater access to Western media they have a picture of what life is like outside of their own country. How has this changed the picture of themselves and their place in the world? Is that a good question or not? <laughs> well, I, they, they don't have, they don't have um, a, a, as much access to uh, international media unless they're fluent in English. And so um, okay. there, a lot of young people uh, do use the internet to access uh, international media and, you know, uh, TikTok and, YouTube and, and everything. So, um, so they can get that kind of access, but you know, Russia has been moving to uh, put clamps on the internet as well. Okay. Until about five years ago or so, it was thought that the internet was allowed to be relatively free as a um, sort of uh, safety valve uh, for people who wanted to uh, have different viewpoints who wanted to see things in a different way, the intellectuals in Russia, and that that was sort of tolerated by the Kremlin. But the, the Kremlin policy has changed, and now they're really making it difficult for anything that doesn't toe the Kremlin line. Uh, so yeah, as Lynn says, it's become a, a quite different, uh, quite different information atmosphere. And that that's been helped by these uh, the for, the so-called foreign agent laws, which have been put into effect. That um, so in a, in a strong agent, which has foreign agent, it has this kind of Soviet era spy sort of feeling to it. And that's any organization. So starting in 2006, 2012, and also just recently in 2020, very broad laws. Any kind of funding, so any organization, any mass media organization, or an NGO that receives funding from out uh, international funding from out of the country has to has to label themselves as a foreign agent and, and everything they put out there has to have that kind of label on it. And then these organizations are subject to uh, law, uh, subject to uh, reviews of their finances, you know, anytime during the year, as opposed to say a regular once a year sort of thing. And so that 
uh, those kinds of associations and those labels have made it hard. And some, some agencies have had to close. Some organizations have had to close because of that. So this idea that, um, you know, you, you might be labeled as a foreign agent and it's even applying more recently to individuals. So individuals who have their own YouTube channels, for example, um, it can be subject to this as well. So individuals, not just big organizations, not just NGOs or media outlets, but in fact, individuals who have maybe a, you know, a, a, a YouTube, you know, a blog or a YouTube channel or something can be labeled that way. Um, so it, it, it can lead to self-censorship, which is uh, kind of bad too, right? Uh, whether it's used to prosecute or not, you can get this, uh, well, I better, I'm a afraid, so I better not do that. Okay. We're uh, near the end of our show, believe it or not. And so I, I, I would like to invite you each to make a brief remark here at the end, and it has to be brief. Okay. So sort of one minute a piece, 30 seconds a piece, one minute a piece maybe. Okay. Uh, so Jonathan, why don't you go first? Uh, a point you would like to emphasize, something you'd like our audience to learn more about, uh, mm -hmm. some uh, parting words here. Uh, sure. Um, so our, our conversation tonight has been focused a lot on on Russia, you know, uh, the the, uh, the Russian Federation, M Putin in Moscow. But I think one interesting thing to keep in mind is that you know there are kind of fourteen other former Soviet republics out there, and some are more Russified than others. Um, but I, you know, I'd encourage people to, when you're looking at the Soviet Union or the post-Soviet world, and thinking about um, you know, what's Putin doing, what's going on, how are, what, what are the state of kind of current relations. I invite people to kind of keep in mind the other Union Republics that existed, the Central Asian states, the Caucasian states, uh, Belarus, Ukraine, and the, and the Baltic states as well, because while they are all very much, you know, they're all wrestling with the legacy of the former Soviet Union, they wrestle with it differently and differently than the, uh, than the Putin regime in, in Russia has. Like Kazakhstan, while it's still pretty authoritarian, it, I think there's a much, uh, the, the footprint of the government there is much less oppressive, even visible at, at some times than in places like Russia. And then in Turkmenistan, you have like a bizarre kind of overwhelming personality cult driven dictatorship, which is even more intense than anything seen in, in, in with Putin in Russia. So just kind of keep in mind the diversity of the post-Soviet experience. Good. Okay, Lynn. You yeah, I would just say that uh, one thing that's I, I try to tell my students is, you know, Russia isn't all Moscow and St. Petersburg, and there's a huge right. Russia's huge, and and there is a huge divide between this the, the urban, there's a big urban and rural divide, and not just urban and rural, but I would say sort of the European Russia or Moscow and St. Petersburg versus sort of the rest of Russia, and the rest of Russia is struggling quite a bit. There's a lot less funding going out there, and so the you know village life is very different from city life, and uh, you have very different. Uh, very different things going on in terms of just people's daily lives. Um, but I do see a little bit of hope. There's some grassroots organizations that I that I've learned about that are doing really great things to help people. And and I see, you know, these small, small uh, groups doing some really positive things. But but they're still there's significant problems. Very good. And Bill? Uh, yeah, I, I, I've moved out of my positive, uh, uh, optimistic phase. I'm, I'm currently in a negative phase. Um, but uh, building on what Jonathan told us, I, I want to uh, join him in uh, stressing that all of the 15 countries uh, that uh, were formerly part of the Soviet Union are interesting in their own right and are distinct and uh, deserve our uh, uh, you know attention. And each is is working as hard as you know or, or try. It's each set of peoples is, is trying to forge their own identity, their own future, etc. And that fact makes Mr. Putin very angry. Uh, so uh, the end of the Soviet Union uh, also created new dynamics in international relations, as uh, we, we have been seeing in recent weeks with the Russian military buildup on the border with Ukraine and the talk between yeah. President Biden and President Putin today. So uh, all, all of these things continue to be very relevant uh, to current affairs. Okay, very good. Well, uh, this has been a very special show for me. I've done a lot of shows. I have a great interest in this topic and I was very pleased to uh, find three, uh, three experts with lots of experience in the area. So there's so much more, a big country with a very long history. Um, so I hope the audience will take some time to learn more. It's easier than ever to learn on your own. Thank you all for joining us on Ethical Perspectives on the News. And uh, hope to see you next time. Thank you very much, Bill and Jonathan and Lynn. That was a great experience for me and I hope for our audience too. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you.